and that we're showing the screen. Okay, cool. We should be working now. Does everybody see my screen? Somebody, somebody tell me yes. All right, awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, so today we're going to be talking about fishing natural lakes versus reservoirs. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. Um, but first off, let me introduce myself. My name is Miles Berghoff. Um, you may or may not know me. Uh, I'm a tournament fisherman. I fish a lot of the FLW Rayovac series. I fish a lot of college events. Um, hopefully next year fishing the FLW Tour. Um, and I'm also co-host of Sweetwater Fishing TV, which is shown on NBC Sports, Sportsman's, and Destination America. So um, got a little bit of experience. Fishing's pretty much my life. So uh, yeah. So let's move on. Press record, dummy. Already done it. Winning. All right, so what are we going to cover? Um, we're talking about natural lakes versus reservoirs, and it's a subject that I feel really strongly about because I think that there, there's a lot of information out there that pertains to one or the other, and it kind of gets lost in translation. So we're going to talk about the basic definitions and differences. Um, we're going to talk about cover versus structure. We're going to be talking about bass movements and then finally lures and techniques that I use. So first off, uh, you know, there's a lot of information out there with the Internet, all the content out there. Um, you've got you've got um, magazines, books, whatever it is. There's a lot of information on bass habits, movements and what type of baits to use. But usually they don't define what type of lakes you're talking about. So for the most part, since most of the United States is reservoirs, we're mostly talking about reservoirs. So when somebody talks about in a magazine, seasonal movements and so on, um, they're mostly talking about the reservoirs out there. OK, so because natural lakes, they're not as defined. OK, so the, the fish spread out more. They don't follow those, those seasonal patterns as much. So the note that I put there is when people talk about bass behaviors, they tend to talk more about reservoirs than natural lakes. So that's why it's a really important subject to me and why we're discussing it today and why you're here. So here we've got some examples, some pictures of some, some uh, mapping software uh, of different types of lakes. We've got Lake Okeechobee, a natural lake, Lake Champlain, another natural lake. We've got Lake Gunnersville in the top left-hand corner. That's a reservoir. And then this is actually a slide from an old webinar. So I accidentally included a river in there too. So that's kind of a natural lake, kind of fishes very similar. All right, so let's first talk about natural lakes. I grew up around natural lakes. I love fishing natural lakes. It's my favorite, and I think that a lot of people have a hard time with them because they learn all that information about reservoirs. They read all those books, they read all the magazines, they hear people talking about the movements of bass, but reservoirs is usually what they're talking about. Again, I don't want to keep on repeating myself, but you know, we keep on going back to the same thing. Um, Natural lakes generally have very gradual structural variations, um, so they're not going to have the real distinct points, distinct ledges. They're not going to have creek channels that you're going to be focusing on. Um, grass is the primary cover. Of course, you're not going to have standing timber or stumps or anything like that because it's not a flooded man-made lake. It's natural, so it's been there a long time. Um, and, you know, you haven't had any wood cover growing in it. Of course, there's exceptions when it comes to like cypress trees. And you're talking about really shallow southern lakes because cypress trees can grow in the water. So every once in a while, you'll find a, a little bit of a different lake. So with natural lakes, one thing that I've found, and it's really important to remember, is that fish spread out. Uh, you know, they spread out a whole lot more than they do on natural or on man-made reservoirs. And so you can find them everywhere. Lake Okeechobee, for instance, that entire lake's covered in fish. Of course, 
in the dead, dead center of it, you're not going to want to fish in the middle of it. But wherever there's cover, that there's there's going to be fish. Now, whether there's a lot of fish there, that's what you got to find out. Now, conversely, um, the seasonal migrations generally are not that big of a factor. So that kind of fits into that whole, um, you know, fish are spread out more thing. And what also fits in there is that big populations of residential fish live on natural lakes. So they tend to stay in the areas um, that they choose, you know, they, they tend to stay in one area, one general area. They don't tend to move like on a, on a reservoir, they'll move into the back of a creek during the fall and then they'll make their way back out during the winter, you know, and so on and so forth. But natural lakes, they like to find one spot where they can live their entire life and, uh, and they just kind of congregate in those areas. And the final note there. Very important, structure enhances cover. This is kind of one of my um, theories, I guess, that I came up with after moving from California to Florida back after high school. Um, I started to realize that, that there was a big difference between how bass relate to cover in natural lakes as opposed to how they relate to structure in, in reservoirs. So uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Again, some examples of natural lakes. You can see uh, Champlain's a little bit different. It's got, it's got some structural variation. It does have long points. You've got a lot of humps. Um, there's a lot of different stuff out there. You're focusing on rock piles and things like that a lot of times for the smallmouth. Um, but for the most part, it still has a pretty gradual uh, structural variation. You're focusing more on the grass types you know, the grass composition, then you are the structural elements. And then Lake Okeechobee, that's like straight vegetation. I mean, that's what you're focusing on. You're focusing on vegetation and hard bottom. That's pretty much it, you know, and water clarity. All right, so reservoirs. Now, before we actually, before we move on, does anybody have any questions as far as, as the natural lakes go? Of course, we're not done. Uh, we're, we've got a lot more to, to cover. But if you have any questions, like I said in the beginning, do not be afraid to ask. You know, I'll, I'll stop. I love running in tangents. It's kind of my thing. So it's all good. But I don't see anybody. So reservoirs. Reservoirs, are, of course, are man-made, which means that they're a lot younger. They're usually between you know, a hundred years or less, um, as far as their age goes. And so there's a lot less, uh, erosion that's taken place, which means that the structural elements that were there before they got flooded are still pretty much there nowadays. So distinctive truck structural elements and variations, you've got the really distinct points that you can pick out on a map. You can say, oh, that's a hump. That's a creek channel right there. That's a ledge. You, know, you can look at that. You can look at a map and, and check those things out <coughs> as opposed to a natural lake, which you, they're, they're a lot uh, less distinct. Now, the seasonal migrations are a major factor on reservoirs. Reservoirs, because of, of just the way that they're kind of laid out and the, the way that the, the fish relate to the structure more, they're going to move a lot more and also it has to do with the the type of bait fish that they're focusing on which is mostly pelagic bait fish like shad or herring or whatever type of schooling bait fish that moves quite a bit with the seasons so um the seasonal migrations are a big factor and i mean that that next point fits right in there fish are more nomadic than residential on reservoirs now, like I said, all of the information that I'm talking about is general. So you're always going to find a situation like there's always going to be one creek arm on a lake that has fish year round. OK, and so I don't want you to, to completely uh, to use this, um, you know, on every in every situation. This is just a really good starting point for you to kind of understand how they they relate. But you're always going to find residential fish on any lake, really. So. And then finally, we were talking about 
uh, uh, natural lakes, it's the opposite on reservoirs. Cover enhances structure on reservoirs. And again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And here's two examples of, of reservoirs. Uh, uh, I mean, on both of these, you can see that the structural differences and changes are very, very sharp, distinct. You can see the creek channel on, on both. You can see the, the points. You can see the ledges, the bluffs, all those things, easy to see. And those are what the fish are going to relate to. All right. So if there's one thing that I want you guys to, to walk away with, um, it's this, okay? And this kind of relates to, to what we're going to be talking about for the rest. And that's structure versus cover. Now, that's the, that's the major aha moment that I had when it came to fishing natural lakes versus reservoirs, is that fish relate to structure different in, in, in both types of lakes, and the same goes for cover. So let's define what I consider structure and cover. I tried figuring out a way to say this so it sounded really smart, um, but I just couldn't, do it, and then it made sense, and I just really couldn't do it, so hopefully you get it. Structure, the elements that make up the actual shape of the bottom, so you're talking about points, ledges, humps, creek channels. We're not talking about brush piles. We're not talking about you know submerged grass. Um, we're just talking about the bottom itself. So as far as cover goes, um, that's anything natural or man-made that is placed on or over the bottom of a lake to create shelter or ambush points for fish. That includes stumps, vegetation, docks, brush, standing timber, whatever it is, um, that's, that's cover, okay? So natural lakes and cover, all right? So when you think natural lakes, from now on, you've got to think cover, all right? So forget about the structure as much as, as the cover for now, all right? Like I said before, structure enhances cover. And what I mean by that is say you've got, say you've got this, um, this, this grass flat. Or no, let's, let's kind of go back. Say you've got a, um, a deep uh, channel running through a flat, but there's absolutely no cover, all right, which I've seen before on lakes like Okeechobee. You're probably not going to do very well there. I've tried and tried and tried and tried. But for the most part, you, if there's no grass around, if the cover element isn't there, you're, the structure doesn't mean much. Now, there's always exceptions to that rule, and you, know, you always get surprised. But for the most part, you have to have cover first. And cover on natural lakes can just be out on a flat. But if you have really good vegetation out on just a nothing flat, you can still have a really good population of fish. And, and, but the reverse isn't true. You can't have really good structure on natural lakes for the most part and still have, um, have really good fish populations. The difference, and I'm going to make an exception to this when it comes to like the Great Lakes or uh, Lake Champlain is kind of on the cusp, you know, depending on how you like to fish. Um, there's a lot of fish that live offshore on, on the very gradual, uh, uh, structure variations out there. Um, but if you're fishing in the south on natural lakes, for the most part, you're only looking for the cover first. Cover is king. And then you look for the, the structure that enhances that cover. Okay. So you find the good grass and you find the good water clarity. And then you start looking for a, a, a depression next to a, you know, a grass bed. Or maybe there's a little channel, a little man-made channel somebody made that's bumping up right against a, uh, a patch of reeds. So that's that's the sort of thing you're looking for. But you don't need those structured, you know, elements to to make those effective. And like we said, vegetation is a huge factor. You're looking for the the type of vegetation that the fish are holding on. All right, so reservoirs and structure. So we're going the exact opposite. So when I'm fishing a reservoir, I can actually break out the map. 
I can actually take the app here on my iPad. Let me see if I can share this with you guys. Yeah, there we go. All right, so right here we're on Lake Norman, North Carolina. So when I'm about to go to the lake, trying to find where I can go fish, I can actually look at this the, the map and know exactly which structural uh, elements, which which points, uh, which ledges, which little creek turns, um, you know, whatever it is, I can I can see which ones I want to fish and plan accordingly. And then once I get out there, pretty much every single one, as long as they're on that pattern, is going to have fish. But when you find that one point, that long sloping point that at the end of it has a rock pile and a little brush pile right next to it that somebody's planted, that's going to be the key one. That's going to be the one that, that I mean, that's the, that's the juice. So um, in this situation on reservoirs, cover is enhancing the structure, but you don't need the cover for the structure to be effective. So hopefully that kind of explains it a little bit better. Let me see how I go back here. All right. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about seasonal patterns just a little bit. Um, again, these are more geared towards the seasonal patterns that you'd see in reservoirs, but some natural lakes, uh, they, they follow these as well. So during the wintertime, fish live in deeper and a steeper structure and current breaks. They live uh, on the main lake for, for the most part um, or in between the main lake and the backs of creeks where they'll, they'll spend the fall and the spring. Um, and generally, you're going to want to steer away from muddy water. Now with uh, natural lakes, always steer away from muddy water as much as you possibly can. Muddy water is, is usually a bad thing. Now, I've won a lot of money in muddy water on natural lakes, but the big key between muddy water and, and a natural lake um, uh, versus clear water in a natural lake is that, uh, you know, or rather the key between muddy water and, and being effective and not effective is it has to be stable. If it's always muddy in an area, but they have the good, you know, vegetation, you can still catch fish in there. I had I have a spot like that on Lake Okeechobee. I can go there. There's fish there all the time. And it's always muddy. But if I have an area that's clear and and that's what where the that's how the fish like it, then all of a sudden the, it gets muddy. That's where you're not going to have as as much success, if any success at all, if you have wind blowing there and make it dirty. So um, going back to the patterns. So springtime. We're looking at fish moving into the backs of the stable creeks, the creeks that don't have a whole lot of water running back into them. Um, you're looking for the bays and the coves with su suitable spawning flats, hard bottom, um, and a lot of sun exposure. Okay, you want to focus on the areas that are least affected by wind as well. During the summer, fish begin to mo begin moving away from the spawning areas and begin setting up on main lake structure. Um, Current is 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 key when the wind is a, or current is key when current is a factor. So that just means that if you're on a reservoir that that has current, you know that's really big. On Gunnersville, TVA lakes, if you don't have current, you're gonna have a really tough time. All right, I'll just tell you that right now. Um, but on on deep canyon reservoirs that don't have a whole lot of current influence, um, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, fish are a little bit more spread out than, and can be found almost anywhere during the summer. Okay. And, and this especially goes for natural lakes. Again, uh, in natural lakes, fish are going to be everywhere. Um, so you can, you can really focus on, on just finding the best cover and, uh, instead of actually, you know, trying to figure out the, the seasonal locations of the fish. Back up. 
okay? And during the fall, fish follow the, the bait fish back into the creeks as the water begins to cool. Creeks with running water are big. Um, beginning of the fall, fish can be found shallow. Um, as it gets cooler, fish will begin to make their way back into the winter areas. Again, this is a general seasonal pattern that's really geared towards reservoirs. In natural lakes, again, they're going to stick to those, those general areas that they live their entire lives, and they're going to follow the bait fish wherever it goes within that area. Okay, you're not going to have those big major creeks that there's going to be one big migration of fish moving back into like you would on a reservoir. So movements, natural lakes, um, bass-like areas they can live in all year. When I'm looking for a place for a natural or a fish to live in a natural lake or looking for a place to, to, to start looking for fish, um, I like to look for an area that has a little bit deeper water at, in some location but has really, really good cover. It's got a lot of different mixtures of grass. It's got a lot of protection from the wind. Um, whatever direction the wind's coming from and, and it's got hard bottom. Okay. That's why we'll go back to Lake Okeechobee on the iPad app here. All right. So that's why let's zoom out. So for instance, if you keep up with Lake Okeechobee tournaments, you know, that this location right here, North Shore, Horse Island, uh, you know, Bird Island, all, uh, all this area right here is absolutely loaded with fish. And every year somebody in the top 10 either wins or does extremely well just in this area because that's where they live. All year round they can find all kinds of different stuff because they're sheltered, they're protected. Um, the, uh, the water clarity is really good year round because of the vegetation and it's got a little bit deeper water uh, for those months that they need the deeper water. And it's also got the real shallow, hard bottoms um, where, where fish are going to spawn. So look for those areas that have all of those different factors, and you're going to find a productive area. Let's go back here. <clears throat> so flats are the primary structural element on a, on a uh, uh, natural lake. You're, you're, you're really looking for those, those, those big flats with the elements that I was talking about, really good cover, um, some sort of deep water refuge nearby. Um, you know, those basic, you know, aspects, but for the most part, it's just going to be a big flat. Okay. So, and flats can be really daunting to, to break down because they're so large and so we're going to talk about some of the baits that, that I like to use to cover water quickly. And so you can, you can find those small populations of fish that, that tend to group up on those big flats. Okay. So the, the more southern the lake, the less they will migrate uh, during the seasons. So say up north, um, we'll use Lake Champlain again, uh, cause I, I haven't fished a ton of lakes up North yet, uh, just the primary tournament lakes, but Lake Champlain is a good example because fish that are super, super shallow during the summer are probably going to want to move out uh, a little bit when the ice freezes. So it, you need a little bit deeper water and sometimes they have to move a little bit further, but not nearly as much as they do on reservoirs for the most part. Um, fish migrate in heavily vegetated lakes based on vegetation health and growth. This is especially true down in Florida. Florida is constantly changing. The lakes there are week in, week out different. Okay. The grass grows differently each year, whether that's because they're spraying it or, you know, doing some kind of control, uh, of the, of the vegetation, um, or it just, you know, we had a tough winter or, or something like that. The grass is going to be different every single year. So where they move is based on how that grass is growing. If the grass is the same in an area that they've stayed in for a long time, they're not going to move that much. But if you go to an area that produces year in, year out, 
and you go there, the water's muddy, the grass is like non-existent. I mean, I went to to Lake Kissimmee this year and or last year filming Sweetwater and we went to a, a, a area of the lake that that usually is covered with bogs, all kinds of of lily pads, grass everywhere. And it was totally void of all the vegetation that used to be there. So the bass weren't there. So they'll move based on uh, those changes in the grass. Uh, natural lakes, bath, and we've already said that a thousand times. Um, again, I've said that a thousand times. Residential populations of fish in, in natural lakes. So what do I focus on in natural lakes? Again, I focus on the flats. Um, but primarily, I mean, the whole lake's flats. And, and for most natural lakes, that's how it is. Um, but I like to look for a lot of different cover options. I look for different types of vegetation. I don't like to just see one type of vegetation, uh, whether it's, you know, if I have hydrilla, I want to see something like some, some eelgrass mixed in there, which means that there's hard bottom. Or I want to see some reeds mixed in with some some uh, some hydrilla or hyacinth, you know, whatever type of healthy grass mixture you have, um, the, the more the merrier. Um, and then I like to look for a good clean bottom and clear water. Okay, those areas, if they have those conditions, those 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 key ingredients, they're going to be productive year in year out. Until they change, of course. And like I said, deep water is not ne always a necessity, but access to some relatively deep water is always a plus, or usually a plus rather, especially if you're fishing up north, um, where the the weather changes really dictate them moving someplace else. And like I said, look for the consistently clean water and stable conditions under heavy winds. Wind is a big factor on natural lakes because it can really dictate uh, the where the food source is, but more importantly, the water clarity and the water conditions. So in natural lakes, I'm always looking for the clearer water, um, except for in those situations, like I mentioned before, where you've got consistently dirty water in an area, but it still has the really good vegetation. Um, uh, you know, I have, like I said, one place on Okeechobee that, that fits that bill. It's always got good fish in it. And uh, so you just look for those areas that are stable. Stable is the key word. So movements in reservoirs. Um, again, fish move more during the seasons in reservoirs. Uh, focus on structure as migration routes. So fish use uh, the structural differences as migration routes and little truck, truck stops. So if they're going into the back of a creek during the fall, they're going to bump into a, uh, a secondary creek uh, or a secondary point, and they're going to post up on that point. And while the, the bait fish are rolling over that point to get to the back of the creek, they're just going to be gorging themselves. So they're going to use that as a stop. And then as soon as they're, they're done feeding, they're going to keep on moving, hit the next point, and then keep on moving, hit the next point, so on and so forth. So you're going to want to follow those seasonal guidelines we talked about closely on reservoirs. And um, you can still find res residential fish that don't move much in reservoirs like we talked about. But the populations are usually much smaller. Um, generally speaking, they're not going to be quite as big or as healthy. Um, so, you know, most tournaments are one and most, most guys that do really, really well are focusing on those nomadic b bass that really are feeding hard on, on bait fish and uh, are really in their prime. But you can still do really well finding some, some residential fish. Um, if you don't pay attention to the seasonal patterns uh, during, the, during the year and you just, if there's any time you need to pay attention to it, it's during the spring and the fall. Okay, spring, they're really moving, they're going fast. So if you're not one step ahead of them, you're going to be way behind and you're going to be you're going to be just treading a lot of water um, because this during the spring, when you have that first major warm up, 
um, those fish are just going to hightail it to the backs of those bays, the backs of those creeks to start spawning. Okay. And they're going to stop on those truck stops along the way. Um, and during the fall, same thing. Those, those major creeks that have the incoming water where the bait fish are going into the back, that's going to be, that's going to be key. And those fish are going to be moving long distances to get there and they're going to do it really quickly. During the winter and the summer, those are the most stable months, especially the summer. Summer, they're very stable. So if you find a group of fish in July, you're probably going to have the same group of fish on the same point or, or hump or ledge, whatever you're fishing, in August. They don't move around a lot. Um, they can if they want to, but for the most part, they're going to stick in one area and just stay there for the entire summer and just eat 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 that's i mean that's pretty much all they're going to do so for the most part during the the uh, winter and summer you don't have to 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 pay as much attention to <clears throat> the current conditions uh, as you would especially in the summer but um in the winter you do need to pay attention to the current conditions but they're not going to move as much so uh, where to look during the seasons in reservoirs all right, so it, it, this is again, it's kind of even more seasonal patterns and kind of getting into it. Um, I'm not even sure we need to mention this because I kind of went over it before, but summer fish are more spread out, but the majority of the fish will be on the main lake. The points, especially long points, long tapering points, anything that that has a real long taper to it that goes out towards the main lake, the main channel, those are going to be really good. Saddles, humps and other structure close to the main lake. I like to focus on the more gradual structure like I just mentioned. Um, and, you know, mostly on the main lake, if you've got current, big factor. During the fall, uh, fish tend to focus on the creeks that have fresh incoming water. Um, fall bait fish into these creeks. Look for secondary points that we talked about, those little truck stops and little creek channel bends. So those are the two key uh, structural elements that I look for during the winter on steep structure areas um, that are either on the main lake or halfway back into the creeks. So I like to look for bluffs that generally the most effective bluffs for me aren't on the main lake. They're kind of halfway back into the, into those creeks where they're at in the fall. Okay. And, and close to where they're going to spawn in the spring. So look for those, those creek channel bends that go really close to the shoreline. Those fish are going to be so grouped up there. Um, I mean, if if you're on a on one of those bends that touches the shoreline where it's really super steep, um, there's a really good chance you're going to have a lot of success there. Um, so during the spring, I just look for those areas that have suitable spawning habitat that are protected from the wind, getting a lot of sun sun exposure, um, that have hard bottom. And then, you know, I try to figure out what stage of the spawn they're in. If they're spawning, go up shallow, go look for them. If they're in pre-spawn mode, look for things that are adjacent. Like if you've got some standing timber right outside of a creek um, where they're going to spawn, gold. You're going you're gonna to catch some fish. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, so far, as far as what we've talked about, all right, cool. We got a question. I love questions. In terms of lakes where they spray uh, a lot, such as Okeechobee and Toho, how does that affect the fish that tend to stay in one area? In in lakes, how far do you feel that fish are willing to travel in terms of spawning periods, such as post spawn and pre spawn, away from areas that they tend to live in their entire lives? That's a big question. Let me talk about the first one first, spraying. Spraying on natural lakes is a really, and even on reservoirs like, like Gunnersville, it's a really common occurrence nowadays, and it really does affect the fish, but not like everybody would think uh, right off the bat. You'd think that if you are, if you've got sprayed vegetation, immediately those fish are going to leave because, it, you know, you're talking about chemicals. I haven't found that to be the case. In fact, I held the uh, the, the national two-day BFL weight record for several years on Lake Okeechobee 
Um, I had, I had 50, 50 pounds, like 10 ounces or something like that for two days. And I was fishing sprayed grass. Like the grass was dead. It was hyacinth. They just sprayed during practice. I watched them out on their airboat spraying this stuff. And, and I was just like, I got back there. The water was really dirty. I'm like, man, I, I don't like this, but I was just like, I'm going to give it a shot anyways. Well, what happened was they had sprayed these large flats of hyacinth and before the fish had actually been spread out underneath that entire mat of hyacinth. And after they started spraying it, um, they, those fish moved to the edge of the hyacinth and before they're, they're going to move on They're they're, they're away from the shallow portions and just spread out. And they went out to the more stable water on the edge. And so what I did was I, I went in there and started flipping and I caught a fish on every pitch for like 10 minutes. And then I finally had a pitch that didn't, I didn't catch a fish. And then I kept on catching fish. It was nuts. And that's when I realized that if an area has sprayed grass, you're going to have a window where those fish are going to bite, that they're still going to be in that area before they move on. Generally, if you have sprayed grass and the, the, I'll use hyacinth as an example because that's the most most common spray grass. Um, it's it's going to have a period where it's not going to start melting yet. It's it's not going to fall to the bottom. It, as long as it's still floating, I feel like it's still fishable, and fish are still going to relate to it if they don't have any other place to go. And that's the big key: is that if they have another place to go that's within you know a couple hundred yards. Um, then they're going to go there because they don't want to deal with the sprayed grass. But if it's an area that's secluded from everything else and they don't have any options but to kind of make the best of what they have, then then I would stay there and fi figure out where they're, they've gone because a lot of times that's the the best fishing is, is when they're confined to those little areas. In that instance, it was the edge of that grass. So it, it really depends. If the grass starts melting away and falling to the bottom, I don't have a lot of luck there. Really not something that I like to fish. And I don't think that the fish like to be around it either. But if it's still on the top, you know, and it still looks somewhat alive, then it's not a big deal. And I think you should fish it. Now, as far as um, how far they're willing to, to travel in terms of, of, of the spawning periods, I would say that there's different types of fish that that um, will travel different distances. There's some fish that that will travel miles to get back into a, a spawning creek, and there's some that are not really residential, but they're not willing to travel all that distance. And so I think that it really it really depends, you know. But for the most part, I really think that. You just have to look at the 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 creek that you're that you're fishing. You know, if it has the the structure that is suitable for for living all year round, like if it's a really deep lake and you you've got one major creek that has real deep water, has, it has all the structure that you need throughout the lake, and it can be considered its own main lake um, itself. Um, cause a lot of these lakes have major Creek channels that, I mean, the fish aren't going to move, you know, eight miles into the back of the Creek and then go all the way back into the main lake. They're going to be kind of in the, each section of that, that Creek. So, um, it's, it's hard to tell your job during the spring is to find the locations that have the majority of the fish. And I don't think that they're going to move more than, uh, say a mile during the spring. And that's kind of my short answer is is I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to focus on any fish that, that move more than a mile. And if they moved a mile, shoot, a mile's even too much, really, in my opinion. But I, I think a lot of fish will do that. Um, but, uh, but generally, I'm fishing for fish that are like 100 to 200 yards. That's their movement. Um, so, so, yeah, I would, I would say focus on those. That way you're not one step behind the entire time. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, all right. So favorite baits and techniques for natural lakes. 
when I first moved to, to Okeechobee or moved to Florida and I started fishing Okeechobee again, I bust out the, I was so used to busting out the topographic maps and looking for the structural elements. And then I'd go to that spot and I'd find out that it looked really awful. The vegetation wasn't there, you know, whatever. And I wasn't able to catch any fish. And then I started realizing that all I had to do was just go fish. And so over time, I kind of, my, my fishing style evolved into something that's, that is just drop the trolling motor and cover a ton of water until you find those big concentrations of fish. And so baits like, um, you, everybody's heard of the skinny dipper. I use the Z-Man grass kickers. It's a little grass uh, swim bait. It's like six inches long. It's made for covering uh, water, th throwing it through grass. So I'm using, you know, vicious braid, uh, 50 pounds, 65 pound, making a long cast with these grass kickers or, or speed worm style baits or toads and just covering a lot of water. But those, those three right there, those are my favorite. If you've got shallow water and say, you know, um, five feet or less, and you've got grass, especially emergent vegetation, like little reeds, uh, pencil grass, um, uh, Kissimmee grass, things of that sort, or even pads. Um, those are the three key baits that I love. On on Lake Champlain last year, I fished an open up there, missed the check by like an ounce. I was the the first one out of a check. I finished 41st, um, and the top 40 got a got a check. But I had a great time. I caught over 150 bass. I'd say during the two days of the tournament, and it was all on a grass kickers a style bait. And uh, I just was had one area that I just cover a lot of water with. It was really exciting because you're fishing it on top and uh, and they just destroy it. And they just love that that style bait out there on on these natural lakes. And a speed worm, it's the same deal. You fish it a very, very similar fashion real fast. The good thing about a speed worm is you can actually drop. I like it during the spring because you can drop it into those holes. So if you're you're coming over a, a grass hole you can actually stop and let it flutter to the bottom and uh, where they probably are spawning so that's a really good bait for that reason you can do that with the grass kickers but i kind of like the the action of a speed worm fluttering to the bottom uh, of the you know of that that depression or that hole and then toads are really good. I like toads, especially during the spring and the summer months. The spring and the summer months are really good. On Lake Okeechobee, it's a year-long deal, and it's one of the most exciting uh, strikes you'll ever have. It's similar to a grass kickers or a speed worm, but you tend to get more explosive strikes. Um, uh, the, the hard legs uh, frogs from from uh, Z-Man, they make a really good one because it's that Elastec technology. It's super soft and it's also really buoyant so you don't have any problem with it wanting to dig in. But that's a really good one. Um, spinner baits for areas that are a little less congested with, with vegetation. I like spinner baits a lot. On natural lakes, I've actually used um, multiple blade spinner baits much more, like three or more blades. Um, Booyah came out with a uh, quad spinner bait, and I think some other companies make one too. Um, but uh, they made one, and that one's really good because there's a lot of really small bait fish around the grass in natural lakes, and uh, and I had a lot of success with that as well. Um, and then for covering water with with submergent vegetation that's maybe in deeper water, like 10 to 12 feet, uh, lipless crankbaits are really good. Jerk baits are excellent as well. So those are my favorite baits for covering water uh, on natural lakes. And then once I find the locations that the fish are, are really focusing on, a lot of times I'm flipping. Okay, so I'll find the area where the, the fish are, are at, and then I'll try to fine tune that area, fine tune my approach, and flip. Okay, so I'm going to be either flipping, pitching, or punching heavy vegetation. And I'm going to be using like a little punch craws from Z-Man or, or a turbo craws with a, you know, a one and a half ounce weight if I'm, if I'm, if I'm punching and if I'm flipping, I'll use something like a, a flapping craws with a lighter weight. Just depends on the, the, how much cover you have. And then if it's real clear water and the, the bites kind of tough, 
and you've got real isolated cover, um, I go for, for uh, techniques such as wacky rig, you know, the Z-Man zinkers or, you know, other types of stick baits. Those work really well. My new favorite is the Ned rig. That thing's insane. You've got to try it. Uh, that's the, the Z-Man TRD paired with their Shrooms jig head. Awesome deal. Um, I use finesse tubes, especially up north. You know, something like the Secret Lure Stupid Tube. Really good baits for up north where you've got those gobies. You're fishing for, for smallmouth. You know, things like that. So, love those things. All right. Favorite baits and techniques for reservoirs. Really... It runs the gamut in, in reservoirs because there's there's so many different variations in them. Um, but for search baits, I love to cover. Well, <clears throat> let me explain this first. When I'm when I'm going to a lake or a reservoir and trying to figure out where the fish are, I want to go from uh, I want to cover all depth zones. So during the summer, I'll start at top water and then work my way down down deep. Um, but during other parts of the year where it's cooler, sometimes I'm not going to use top water unless I really feel like that's going to be be effective. But usually I'll start like shallower and work my way down to deep. Now, if it's during the, the winter, I'll probably just start deep and won't even go anywhere else. But anyways, for top water, I like buzz baits and walking baits. You can move those really quick. Poppers are more of a saturation type bait. Poppers and, and prop baits, those are something that once you've found the fish, you can slow down and really pick them off of isolated pieces of cover. Um, but buzz baits and walking baits, really good at covering water. When I've got fish in shallow water, like five feet or less, I'm looking at, at shallow crankbaits, you know, uh, lipless crankbaits, spinner baits, wake baits, those type of baits that can move a lot of water but are staying in that top level of the, the strike zone. Um, mid depth, I like the medium deep diving cranks. Um, jerk baits are really good if you've got clear water, and also if you have clear water, swim baits are really good. And then when you got deep water, Carolina rigs are like that's like the king of a search bait uh, for deep water because you're maintaining constant contact with the bottom. You're understanding what the bottom composition is, and uh, and you can you can just drag that thing. And, and it's a really good search bait. And then spoons, of course, and umbrella rigs. Those are really great for suspended bass uh, if you have to catch those fish out really deep. So the slower saturation baits. So once I've found the, the pattern that I like and I've found the areas that I've, I want to focus on, that's where I'm going to start using the football jigs, the shaky heads, and flipping the pit and pitching if the water's high and the fish are up in brush or, or whatever type of cover there is up shallow. So those are those are my favorite baits for, for those applications. And finally, um, you, you're going to want to focus more on patterns than areas. Okay, so uh, in natural or natural lakes, I like to just drop the trolling motor and go fish. On reservoirs, I've got a plan in my mind about where the fish are going to be based on the seasonal pattern, what type of structure I need to focus on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the big engine, hop from one to the next, one point to the mm -hmm. next, one hump to the next, and then, uh, and then you know, drop the trolling motor, make a few casts, cover those different depth zones, and then move on. I'm not going to just dro drop the trolling motor and work my way back into a creek you know, and spend hours doing that because it's just a waste of time. And, you know, and it, it, it's already hard enough to find fish. So you don't want to just waste a bunch of time. But yeah, that's what I like to do. And, and uh, so I focus more on the patterns, figure out which structural, uh, structural elements or what type of pattern the fish are following, and then just keep on running that. Use your maps and whatever. I think that might be it. Let me see. Yeah, that's it. So any other questions? Yeah, blueback herring lakes. So Question is, do I have any experience on blueback herring lakes like Lake Lanier? 
how do I target nomadic fish chasing bluebacks? All right, so I've had limited experience out on Lanier, but I, I know how tough it is out there. The blueback experience that I've had is primarily on, on lakes on the Savannah River, like uh, uh, I'm not sure if Lanier actually attaches to the Savannah River, but uh, like Clarks Hill, that one I have a lot of experience on. And those are really tough to fish. I mean, primarily what I do is the majority of the year, those fish are, are out on the main lake humps and ledges. So I look for, if you really want to <clears throat> play that card and fish for those fish, which generally seem to be bigger, but less stable, um, then then you just go to the the main lake structure pretty much almost in the entire year and uh, other than the spring and just focus on on those fish eating those blueback herring the a lot of times it's the it's the most main lake um uh, uh, humps and long gradual points that they're going to focus on so that's what i generally do so when i go to lanier which i've been there several times um, that's what I do is I always go to the main lake, focus on the, 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 uh, humps that are near the deepest water and cover water quickly with a, with a swim bait on top, moving it really fast. That's one of the keys when it comes to blue back herring is that they move really quickly. And so if you slow down at all, it's almost like peacock bass fishing. If you've ever been peacock bass fishing, you can't slow down a bit. If you move, if you slow down that bait, they're not going to hit it. And, uh, it's the same thing with blueback herring fish is that I like to use things like the, the triple trout, um, things that I can move really, really fast. And, uh, and yeah, they just come up from a mile and crush it. Uh, but, uh, you know, one thing that I don't really like fishing the blueback herring fish, to be honest with you on lakes like Murray and, and, and Lanier, that's really frustrating to me. I like to focus on the fish that are more stable into the backs of the major creeks, like on Clark's Hill, the little river on the Georgia side, um, go all the way into the back of that, that creek. I had a, a BFL regional. I almost won back there, um, fishing, uh, a shad pattern. And, and so those fish are a lot more stable, especially during the fall. If you're, if you're looking at the fall and the water's starting to cool, Focus on those shad more than those blueback herring because those shad are going to be moving in droves into the backs of the creeks while the blueback herring are just running around all over the place. And, uh, and, and so you can do a lot better out on uh, in the backs of the creeks. So if you don't like doing the blueback herring thing, which is really exciting but also really frustrating because you never know when they're going to come back up, um, then, then try, try your hand at going back up to – the, the backs of the creeks. There's always fish there and, uh, and you can do really well. That kind of answered the question. Anybody else have any questions? I'm glad that hopefully helped. All right, guys. Well, uh, if there's no other questions, I really appreciate it. Um, I've I've been recording this. At least I hope it's it continue to record. But um, yeah. But anyways, I'm gonna record this. If anybody wants to to watch it after the fact. Please let me know, um, you know, and, and I'll get that recording for you. I'm still working on a place to put all these recordings so people can watch them at a, any time. It might be on my website, sonarfishing.com, or we might put them on Sweetwater. Um, but, uh, but anyways, thank you guys so much. Have a great day, and, uh, and just keep an eye out for the next seminar, webinar. Later.